Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Osasu Show. Our focus today is on foreign policy. If you remember clearly, the election of Donald J. Trump as the 45th President of the United States transformed not only the political landscape of the U.S., but that of the entire world. Subsequent to Trump's shocking electoral victory, we saw France follow suit with the emergence of Emmanuel Macron, a 39-year-old who became the youngest president in the history of France. Prior to these two monumental events, Nigeria witnessed similar change in our political landscape as President Muhammadu Buhari defeated the incumbent president, Goodluck Jonathan, in May 2015. Our focus today is to assess the relationship between the United States and Nigeria, its foreign policy, and the projected reaction of the US to issues such as the 9 trillion Naira scandal plaguing the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC. Don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back on the Osasu. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Osasu Show. With me now is Mr. Matthew Page, who is one who is a former US intelligence community expert on Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Can you tell me what did that role encompass and what sort of intelligence did you gather on Nigeria for the United States? So it sounds very exotic, right? It sounds very much like James Bond, but actually <laughs> Um, it was far more uh, straightforward than that. I mean, basically, you have policymakers in the United States, from the president all the way down to the secretary of defense, you know, government people who are making decisions about their relationships with foreign countries. And unless you're some sort of geography, history, politics whiz, it's very difficult to know everything there is to know about what's going on in the world. And so they relied on people like me to kind of be their um, you know, private advisors on that type of on that type of information. Yes. Okay. So, what kind of information were you providing? So, mostly, um, I mean, politics. You know, things about the military and uh, the security situation, election time, all that. You know, back and forth stuff that I think Nigerians live and breathe on a daily basis. If you're an American or an American policymaker in Washington, you just kind of want to know what the most important facts are about that and how that will affect your dealings with that country so that you don't walk into a meeting with the Nigerian ambassador or the Nigerian president and not know sometimes something as simple as how to pronounce Yaradua, <laughs> you know, very that's, that's very important. So okay. it's, uh, and we recently saw that, right, when uh, President Trump very famously mispronounced Namibia. <laughs> <laughs> he, made, he made up his own African country. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right, that's right. So that shows where, mm -hmm. you know, just having good knowledge and good people to advise you is really important. Um, and I don't think it's as sinister or as sexy as, as people make it out to be. Okay, uh, okay. When we look back at the relationship between the United States and Nigeria dating back to the beginning of civilian rule in 99, we see most of the foreign policies focus a lot on peacekeeping and, uh, you know, regional peacekeeping in Nigeria. But have, has that relationship grown uh, any further since you started working uh, here in 2003? I think it has, and I think we tend very much to look at the relationship between the United States and Nigeria through the lens of our two governments talking, right? But I mean, here we are an example of that not being the case. Like, you know, we're totally outside those fears, yet there are these, you know, U.S.-Nigerian relations, right, that are, that are taking place all around us as we speak. So I think that for me, you know, since the return to civilian rule, and also with the things like the advance of technology and communication, you know, those relationships have blossomed. Um, but generally speaking, I always got the feeling, and I know there's a lot of suspicion about the United States 
out there in Nigeria. But I always got the sense in dealing with all of these policymakers who are working on Nigeria that, that everyone was very well disposed to, to Nigeria and Nigerians generally and the attitude amongst you know, American government officials as let's try to do things that helps Nigeria sort of achieve its potential. You know, it's being held back by all of these challenges. What can we try to do to, you know, decrease Help. those? Yes. But when these funds are looted and, you know, confiscated abroad, we find it challenging to repatriate these funds back to our country to invest in our economy. But the United States claims that they're looking to help African countries like Nigeria grow, yet they make it so difficult for us to get our funds back. Why do you think this is and what are the bottlenecks we need to overcome? No, you raise, this is such an important point and I think it's one that frustrates many of us, many Nigerians, right? It's like we know the money's stashed over there, why don't we just go and take it back and, and bring it back? One of the things I think that's the sort of dirtiest little secret about the UK and US financial systems is they're really designed, right, to facilitate this type of um, money laundering and corruption by by foreign officials in their financial systems. And it doesn't just affect Nigeria, right? I mean, there are people mm -hmm. around the world whose officials are using those tools to put money into the, into the economy of the UK and the US. Until those loopholes are closed, the other promises on anti-corruption kind of ring hollow. Let's horn in home, uh, bring it home right now. Mm -hmm. How would you assess President Buhari's fight against corruption? Uh, so first of all, I would say up front that I think that um, it's, I think I, my line is it's significant, but it's selective. So, and I think everyone will know what I mean by that, which is that, you know, it's probably more significant in terms of what the EFCC is doing in other parts of the government than probably at any time, you know, since 1999. But at the same time, you and I both know that there are a lot of people in the ruling party, in government now, sitting governors from both parties. I mean, we all know that the party labels don't mean very much in the sense that there are plenty of people in the previous dispensation who are, you know, who've reinvented themselves and are now in government. And I feel like they, by, by joining government and sort of joining the winning team, they've been, they've inoculated themselves, at least for the time being, against that type of scrutiny. But I would also say, in the EFCC's defense, that, you know, the judicial system, you know, the, the law, of course, I mean, they still have to prosecute cases, of, you know, and present evidence and so forth, um, are, are really stacked heavily against them. Uh, and it's not a perfect organization by any means, but I would say that they've, you know, made some significant progress during this time. And perhaps, you know, in future dispensations, a lot of those same guys will be investigating and prosecuting people who are in government now. Mm -hmm. But when, you, when yeah. you hear issues like the 9 trillion Naira scandal plaguing the, the NNPC right now, you, how do you respond to that? Because Buhari has an international reputation, you can correct me if I'm wrong, of ha being, having very high integrity, right? The international community believe he's incorruptible and uh, he's going to fight corruption to its barest minim minimum. But when we hear issues like 9 trillion naira going on, you know, scandal going on in the NMPC, like how does the international uh, community respond to that kind of allegation? Well, what's interesting is, I mean, and this is true probably in any relationship, but, um, you know, the honeymoon period for Buhari with the international community is over. Um, I would argue it's probably over with many Nigerians as well. Um, but, you know, but that honeymoon period elapsed for Obasanjo, Believe it or not, there was quite a significant honeymoon period for uh, Jonathan in the international community that again, you know, ended at some point. And so, uh, so that's a big, a big issue. I mean, I think people are not um, ignorant or blind to, to what they see going on despite, you know, excuses that are being made or what have you. And I think the fundamental problem is, and we can, and we can talk about this more, is that um, Buhari's approach when he came into government was to say, you know, the system has been poorly led. The system's been led by corrupt people. I'm not corrupt, I'm gonna come in and I'm going to sort of transform the system through my leadership and through appointing people that I think are trustworthy. But the problem is, is that it's not 
a matter of leadership. The system is, is, is flawed and needs reforms. And I'm not saying that it needs revolutionary reforms that would, that would kind of happen at a breakneck speed. I'm saying you know, incremental but definite reforms you know, to, to things. And the NNPC is a fantastic example. To start. Yes. I, I mean, the NNPC as a company you know, meets no reasonable standards of how a national oil company or even a, you know, a corporate entity should function. Okay. Yeah. On that note, let's take a short break <laughs> and when we return, more with Mr. Matthew Page. Don't go anywhere. There is a reason Africa is called the new frontier. What was once potential is now an opportunity ready to be seized. Once revered for our resources, today's wealth lies in our people. People who build the cities that shape the future. People who know an idea in one place means business in another. A generation for whom technology means there are no borders, no boundaries. We are the new lions in a brave new world. Kings of the urban jungle. And there's a bank that puts the world in our pocket and the future in our hands. UBA, Africa's global bank. Welcome back to the Osasu Show. Still with me is Mr. Matthew Page, former U.S. intelligence community expert on Nigeria. Thank you so much for sitting tight. Oh, thank you. Um, can you tell me more about uh, the systems that we need to have that would further our democracy as a nation and also boost economic development uh, uh, in our country, given the fact that we just came out of recession, although some may argue that we're still in recession because the common man on the street is still suffering and plagued by the everyday lack of food, electricity, water, etc. No, I mean, I think you make, make a really good point. And on the recession point, I think until Nigeria is really seeing sort of 3% or more in terms of consistent annual GDP growth, rather than just that sort of little tick over the line of zero back into positive growth, you're not really seeing the economy having any forward momentum because Nigeria still has a significant population growth rate. And so if your population growth rate is still high, you know, you need to exceed it with your GDP growth rate or you're splitting the same amount of economy with, with, a, with a greater number of, of, of people. So, you know, a 0.5% GDP growth rate isn't, is, you know, we're really still in recession when you, when you think about it. I think that what I'm disappointed about this, you know, this government is they didn't um, come into the situation with a sort of slate of reforms that they could have passed through the National Assembly and sort of written in stone for the most part. Uh, when they came into office during that honeymoon period. I mean, this is a party that controlled the presidency and both houses of the National Assembly. They should have had an agenda that they, you know, that they passed almost immediately. Um, but the National Assembly was never given an agenda, a legislative agenda by the presidency, because the presidency was focused on, you know, kind of leading, right? But the problem is, is that if you don't institutionalize the Buhari effect, then someday, when Buhari is no longer in office, you know, things will revert to the way that they were before. Because the system is the same system that has always been in place. So I feel like Nigeria has the tools, even has the resources, even in a recession, to make progress. But the problem is if you spread those resources so thin, and you spread them, you know, just to the four winds, mm -hmm. Um, it has little or no impact. Exactly. There's no center of gravity exactly. in, terms of, in terms of progress. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's really problematic. I agree with you. Um, so obviously we know the election is coming up as well. If you had to give um, a report to some of the people you advise internationally and tell them, what do you foresee happening in 2019? February 2019, to be precise, which is the day of, uh, which is the month of the presidential elections. I think the big question in everyone's mind is obviously, is the president going to recontest? Um, I think, you know, today, this week, you know, the answer seems to be yes, right? But but that answer may may change. 
Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, there's still the issue that as a structure, the APC as a party is still, you know, um, to a certain extent, this uh, you know, awkward marriage between several different wives, you know, husbands and wives. It's a very mixed bag. It's a polygamous marriage. <laughs> yeah, it's a polygamous <laughs> marriage, that's right. Uh, <laughs> and there are more than four wives. But um, the other is, um, you know, on the other side, you have the PDP, which obviously, you know, suffered some real calamitous, I think, infighting. Now, what I also know, though, is that parties can appear kind of, you know, in very short order, you know, or new networks of, of elites of the powerful in Nigeria can form. That's how the PDP formed in 1999. Mm -hmm. That's how the APC formed in 2013. So these new constructs can, can come together very quickly if, there's, if, there, if they view some sort of opening or, or path forward. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it is out of the question that some sort of um, third party, you know, uh, either a new party or one that sort of occupied a, you know, an old party that exists and they kind of take that over, emerges. I mean, I think that's sort of a tiku sort of perennial strategy um, when it comes to that. But I'm, but I'm not talking about him, I'm talking about sort of other sort of um, disgruntled elements of, um, you know, the APC and the PDP, you know, realigning. Mm. That could happen, but it, but it might not. I think that as we all know, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for, um, you know, to defeat an incumbent president, an incumbent party that controls a lot of governorships. You know, Buhari still has a lot of popularity in, in, in certain parts of the country that's, that's genuine and real. I think that, you know, he will have every advantage when he goes to, to recontest. Some might say, President Buhari wouldn't have won the elections without the United States backing in 2015. But we've kind of seen a laissez-faire attitude Trump has towards Africa in general. I mean, as we said earlier, he made up his own country in Nambia, Nambia yeah, that's <laughs> instead right. of Nam Namibia uh, when he met with uh, the African presidents. Uh, so how do you assess Trump's influence? over the electoral process that will occur in 2019. Do you think he's invested enough to see that we have a free and fair election? Um, I think Trump's very disinterested in most things, but especially Africa. And I've written that this may not be a bad thing, sometimes benign neglect when it comes to President Trump is, is kind of a good thing. Um, I think he views Africa as a place for his country club buddies to go off and do business deals he and, did say and get that, rich. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what yeah. it is. And I wrote that that sort of, you know, has echoes of sort of colonialism and King Leopold and sort of this view that Africa is a place where you go and explo you know, exploit, you exploit yeah. you know, either resources or people. So I, I'm sort of uh, you know, abhorred by that type of talk. I think it's really backwards. And um, I think the other thing too is, and, and we all know this, um, you know, Trump is a sort of a white nationalist, you know, pretty fundamentally racist person. And the people around him are as well in the top, top levels. Now, I, what I would say in the defense of sort of US approach to Nigeria is because the, those individuals at the top don't really care about what's happening in Nigeria or what's happening in Africa. But I think you'll see just basically some of the usual um, type of um, rhetoric from, from uh, the Americans and, and other international partners mm -hmm. about the importance of voting, the importance of a good, a good process. Mm -hmm. But I don't think by any means will you see any sort of, you know, uh, favoring one particular candidate over another. I think they go to great pains to avoid that, even if the perception is not always the case from the Nigerian side. I see. Sticking with Trump and the United States uh, foreign relations with Nigeria, 
The U.S. ambassador, sorry, the Nigerian ambassador to the United States, who is about 82 years old, was uh, rejected once by the Senate, and he was reconfirmed a little later when President Buhari pushed his name forward again. The name has been sent to the United States for confirmation, but we haven't heard any feedback. Has the United States, in your you know, knowledge or uh, understanding, have they rejected this ambassador, or what exactly is going on? So, um, yes, it's interesting. I mean, so um, this, this chap made headlines uh, when he was nominated by an, uh, as an ambassador by Buhari. Um, uh, you know, several months ago, I, you know, he he was rejected by the Senate, as you mentioned, and then and then later later confirmed. Um, he is, you know, a an extremely well respected, you know, uh, Nigerian. But his disadvantage is that he is, I believe, 82, 83 mm -hmm. years old. Um, it's interesting because what I'm what I'm hearing, you know, through the grapevine is that. You know the United States uh, government is is very uneasy about you know sort of agreeing to have this ambassador posted to Washington because that is an extremely arduous job. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe you could do it. I don't, <laughs> I couldn't be you know ambassador Washington. I mean, I think you just have a, a grueling schedule. You're a, a, you know it's a one of Nigeria's largest overseas embassies to manage. So between the internal management duties and the representational duties, um, you know, this is something that needs a very, very dynamic, energetic, um, you know, person with an enormous constitution. Um, and so there's, there's an uneasiness, but there's also a desire to respect, you know, when a country sends you an ambassador, mm -hmm. you can't just sort of say, no, you know, send me another one, but there is an uneasiness, you know, in terms of the process of agreeing mm -hmm. to have that posted there. And there's a, there may be a hope, I would suspect, you know, being an outsider looking in, that, um, that the Nigerian government may sort of reconsider mm -hmm. this and realize kind of, in the same way, I don't know, in any relationship, you try to read your partner's exactly. emo you know, moods, <laughs> try to realize that... Um, they don't want that, to. Yeah, yeah. That, or, that, or that, um, that that person may not be best suited. And they're obviously, I think, a lot of talented Nigerians, a lot of talented Nigerian diplomats. So I don't think there's a shortage for choice. I think that just PMB, for whatever reason, in his mind, really wants this particular guy in this particular post and it's probably not the best fit. Mm -hmm. For the job. That's right. Okay, let's talk about your book, Nigeria, What Everyone Needs to Know. It's a forthcoming book that will be published in January. Mm -hmm. Do we have an exact date? We don't quite yet. Um, it's still with the publisher, but I think we can expect, I was hoping we could see it in uh, our Christmas stockings, mm -hmm. but I think maybe, um, maybe it will come out early, early next year. Any last words to our viewers? No, thanks very much, and please follow me on Twitter at Matthew T. Page, P-A-G-E, and keep an eye out for Nigeria, what everyone needs to know. That's it for today's episode of The Osasu Show. To watch extended clips from this interview, you can visit our website, tostvnetwork.com. For news and sustainable development in current affairs across Africa, also visit our website and check out my personal opinion articles on osasuigmanadion.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media at The Osasu Show, at TOS TV Network, at Osasuigbenadion, on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Let me use this opportunity to appeal to the federal government and President Mohamed Buhari in particular. Your integrity is at stake. Nine trillion naira is the biggest scandal in the history of the entire nation. Nigerians need answers and we need answers today. So please yield to the questions and answer Nigerians regarding this scandal that has plagued the NNPC. I'll see you same time, same place next week. And until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you.